Well, thank you. Sorry, I was running a little bit late. I uh, had some other meetings that um, couldn't break away from, so I apologize for that. But I do want to thank uh, Chairman Messer and Stefanik for uh, convening the task force hearing today. Today we're talking about much more than higher education, although that's the theme. We're, we're talking also about teachers and doctors and mechanics and scientists that will lead our country into the 21st century. I think it's also a good opportunity for us to discuss if our system for funding higher education in the United States is working as we intended it to work. As we look at student loan servicing today, I also think it's important that we do not lose sight of the decision-making process uh, for when students and families consider taking out a loan. We need to be having a more serious conversation in Washington about the $1.2 trillion in federal student loan debt, uh, what it means uh, for both borrowers and taxpayers. The Wall Street Journal shed some light on this uh, last week, and currently they stated that 3.6 million federal student loan borrowers are in default. Three million borrowers are delinquent. Three million are postponing payments due to economic hardship, while just 12.5 million are current on their loans. This means that 43% of the roughly 22 million Americans with federal student loans were either behind or receiving permission to postpone payments due to economic hardship as of January 1st of this year. So how can we, the United States, say with a straight face that these programs are making money? Under the Federal Credit Reform Act, the government makes about $88 billion over the 10-year budget window from 2014 to 2024, but under the fair value accounting, it actually loses $135 billion. Believe it or not, under current scoring rules, the Congressional Budget Office is actually required to use the Federal Credit Reform Act, uh, which does not take into account market risk. The exact market risk we are currently encountering with a struggling economy where graduates are having difficulty obtaining good jobs so that they can repay these loans. There's wide agreement that the federal student loan program should use fair value accounting. I was recently reading a report published by the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee that I was pleased to see underscored CBO's views on what the most appropriate accounting method should be, and I quote, when the government extends credit, the associated market risk of those obligations is effectively passed along to taxpayers who, as investors, would view that risk as having a cost. Therefore, the va fair value approach offers a more comprehensive estimate of federal costs, end quote. Even the left-leaning uh, Brookings Institute is publishing agreeable scholarly work on this topic. So if borrowers are having trouble repaying these loans and the government is losing money, we should take a harder look at how and where it is being spent. So in the coming days, I plan to write the Treasury Sec Secretary so policymakers in Congress have a better understanding of the risk taxpayers are being exposed to by a struggling federal student loan program. My wife and I are blessed to have four wonderful children. Two of them are in college and two still at home. I want to make sure that they have the same opportunities that my parents helped make available to me, but the increasing cost of college is daunting to say the least. Since 1985, the cost of college has increased 250% faster than the rate of inflation. According to the college trap, if the cost of college tuition was $10,000 in 1986, it would now cost the same student over $21,500 if education is, it had increased as much as the average inflation rate, but instead education is 59,800. So what role should we play in helping make sure that students and families make the right financial and educational decisions? First, I think we have a responsibility to make sure students and their families are getting the information they need when making these decisions to take out student loans. For most college graduates, how to pay for college may be the largest financial decision they'll make in their lifetime, at least until they make the consider purchasing their first home. When weighing the full cost of attendance for some universities, the total price tag may come to well over $200,000. This is a staggering figure for a high school student who has spent their summer waiting tables or mowing lawns. On the House Financial Services Committee, we spent a lot of time talking about consumer loans. The Truth in Lending Act was passed in 1968 to promote the informed use of consumer credit by requiring certain minimum disclosures about the terms and real costs of these loans. These are the standardized disclosures financial institutions provide to us when we get a new credit card, purchase a car, or take out a private student loan. However, believe it or not, there is no requirement for these disclosures to be made for federal student loans. Private lenders issued about $8 billion in loans last year, while the Education Department issued about $100 billion. Shouldn't we be holding the government to the same, if not higher, standards than we require of the private market? Don't the borrowers of federal loans deserve information like the annual percentage rate? I also believe we owe it to our nation's youth to provide them with an education that will prepare them to enter the workforce and put them on strong financial footing. 
As the co-chair of the Congressional STEM Caucus uh, in Congress, I believe we can always do more as a nation to show our students that STEM education is important and opens countless doors. Since our founding, the United States has flourished and prospered from American ingenuity and our constant and relentless drive to discover and innovate. My youngest son, Cole, who's 11, has been heavily involved with robotics competitions. Experiencing his passion for technology firsthand only makes me more excited about expanding STEM education in our colleges and schools and encouraging students to pursue those careers. It's also comforting to know that his passion for STEM courses will likely lead him to a successful career. According to a recent report from the National Association of Colleges and Employers, in 2016, engineers are expected to make an average of about $65,000 a year right out of school, while computer science majors are expected to make $61,000, and math and science majors will make $55,000. It doesn't take a math major to calculate the higher return on investment. We also know these students are much more likely to be able to repay their loans because they're making more money. This is not to say students shouldn't pursue a liberal arts degree, which is typically uh, have starting salaries in the low 40s, but we need to make sure that they understand that this choice uh, may not open the same doors. Again, thank you so much for holding this hearing. Uh, I'm excited about uh, starting this discussion. I know there's uh, really some important things that can be done here. I want to thank our witnesses for being here as well. I yield back. Well, again, thank you both uh, for your work on this. It's, it's uh, important and uh, is certainly, as I travel around my district, hearing so oftentimes from um, young people, but also families who are burdened uh, by this and, and be concerned and uh, something we need to be figuring out and talking about. So I want to thank you all as well for, for being here today. Uh, I've got a couple different questions. First, I want to address my first question uh, to Mr. Ramondi, if I may. Um, and I, uh, for all of you, I want to thank you for joining us today. I understand uh, Nebian's uh, business is focused on servicing of federal loans following the split with Sally May. I would appreciate your perspective as a banker on how we have uh, just as much of a federal student loan origination problem as we do a servicing problem. We should be celebrating certainly that more of our nation's young people are making the decision to attend college, but I'm concerned they're making one of the biggest financial decisions of their lifetime at the age of 17 or 18 without maybe having all of the right information. Uh, on page five of your testimony, you state improved disclosures such as the enhanced loan information used in credit card or private education loan disclosures would help potential federal student loan borrowers understand the likely payment amount in context of typical earnings. I understand that TILA uh, was applied to private student, student loans in 2008 and although uh, met with some early resistance from private lenders is now treated as a success. What information are borrowers of private loans getting that borrowers of federal loans are not getting and why is this inf information so important? Thank you for your question and interest in this topic. We, we do think uh, education before students borrow, before the money is lent and spent, is, is critical to uh, future success in this program. Um, in the private student loan programs, you're correct in that the uh, disclosure requirements are far more um, enhanced than what a student uh, will receive in, in the federal loan side of the equation. And they actually go beyond what's required by a standard uh, consumer. Uh, a loan program, Attila uh, type of uh, arrangement. Um, one of the things that we we've, we found is as we provided more information to consumers at the point of origination, they were able to make more informed decisions. They understood how much, what their debt balance would be, um, what their future interest uh, monthly payment requirement would be, and the total amount of interest charges uh, that they would uh, incur over the life of the loan. Um, one particular example that I think was uh, extremely useful for us is um, back when we first, um, during the credit crisis, we revamped our, our um, private student lending operations when we were one, one company. And uh, in that, we started to uh, offer incentives for borrowers to make payments while they were in school. Um, most schools said, you're crazy. Kids can't make payments while they're in school. You need to have deferment options. And we displayed for them how much money they could save by paying interest while they were in school versus deferring the loan balance in total. And uh, in 50, over 55% of our customers chose to make a payment while in school as a result. I used to say during that time frame that people realized that um they didn't know what the definition of negative amortization was, but they knew it was bad. Um, I think today they've forgotten it again. Yeah. Thank you. 
Uh, Ms. Ken, thank you so much uh, for being here. Thank you for your service, uh, you and your family, your husband. Uh, appreciate that so much. Uh, and uh, also very interested, as uh, Chair Stefanik asked about, of how do we make sure that we open up STEM education to, uh, to military folks. So any suggestions you have of how we can do that, make that more accessible, we definitely want to hear from you on that. I do want to um, focus on uh, one of the parts of your testimony where you, you said uh, students should maintain a specific grade in each course to receive funding for the first two years of school. If they fail to meet the grading requirements, they should re return funding for the delinquent courses and perhaps a minimal fee. I wondered if maybe if you could uh, elaborate on your thoughts on that a little bit more. I, I truly respect uh, the charge of personal responsibility. Um, wondering if you would imagine this being applied only to grants or do you think that these students should also be allowed to receive a federal loan? Thank you for your question. Uh, I do feel that this generation is definitely an incentive-based generation. I, I've, I've seen it with the students that I've worked with and I, I recognize it also within myself. And I feel if, if students were to receive a free education but know that they have to meet a certain criteria in order to acquire the funding for the course, they would have a much more incentive to perform at a better rate in the course. As it is now, I see many students who have been receiving financial aid come, they have a hard time managing their, their coursework when they feel like there's not really much of a benefit to, for it at that time. And they sometimes fall behind on their coursework. So if I, I feel if students were to have that responsibility to know that they're earning their financial aid and it's not just given to them, they would the performance would go up significantly. In regard to the STEM programs on military installations, I think that largely has to deal with the contracts to the universities that are used on post. If they had a program a, a university that had the specific, specified programs, they could make the facilities available in order to have the lab sciences and, and the staff required for those courses. Have you heard that that's more widespread? I, I know it was uh, true in your specific circumstance, but from what you've seen, that's pretty widespread as well, that that just isn't as available as it ought to be? Yeah, it's, I've lived in installations all over the world, and from what I could tell, there's just really not much availability for lab sciences, unless you're living in a, an area where there is a university that's available outside of the military installation and military climate. Okay. I can ask just one more line of questions real quick to Mr. Jones. Uh, thank you again for your part as well. Uh, your testimony focuses on making sure uh, students complete college and absolutely agree with that and, and grateful for that. Uh, do you think we could find a way to implement some of uh, Ms. Kent's ideas? Also, do you think it would make more sense to have stronger eligibility criteria for those students uh, to receive Pell grants and other funding in the first place? Uh, and could we base this off of other merits such as high school grades or standardized test scores or what's your suggestion there? Well, those are difficult questions. I don't know that I have the answers to them. I mean, the Pell program has always been uh, really more targeted at low-income students who, unfortunately, generally, you know, have a lower GPA in high school. Um, I, I do think there are successful programs um, in states where the completion, and I think you referenced this, the completion of a semester then provides an incentive to complete you get more uh, money or uh, maybe free books um, if you complete the semester. And so there's more uh, states looking at those kind of programs. So it's kind of you earn it and then and then you get more. New Mexico's like that. Uh, Indiana just um, literally adopted uh, uh, a program um, along the lines that uh, uh, Chairman Stefanik is talking about. Uh, there was an incentive to get 30 credit hours in one year. Year. And uh, these were all low-income students um, that it applied to. For the state is a need-based state. And they had incredible increases in the number of students taking more credit hours um, than they ever have. And so there is something, as, as the, uh, the young lady said, uh, there is something to incentives um, that can be very powerful uh, in, in, in moving this whole thing forward. And so I think this concept of incentives to take 15 in a semester, incentives to complete 
30 uh, that then lead you in the next semester. Uh, uh, some states are, um, colleges are giving uh, on, on time incentives. As long as you're on time, um, you get frozen tuition until you graduate. Uh, so there's a lot of strategies around that um, that can be very effective. Great. Thank you all so much. Uh, again, appreciate uh, your work and want to stay in touch on this important issue. I, I think it really is going to make a difference uh, for families, but also to our future generations. So thank you. I yield back.